in the wee segment. Um, to begin with, I'd just like to uh, acknowledge uh, the co-sponsors of this uh, exhibition as well as a number of events that are associated with it. Uh, it's really great that um, so many departments as well as the uh, Chancellor's, uh, Vice Chancellor's Office of Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion uh, stepped forward to, to give us funds and it's allowed us to bring in some uh, really interesting events coming up that I'll talk in a few minutes. But I'd like to acknowledge the, uh, the Communication Department, the Critical Gender Studies Program, uh, the Ethnic Studies Department, the Literature Department, the uh, International Relations Specific Studies Program, and the Visual Arts Program uh, Department. I'd also like to uh, thank uh, the gallery coordinator, Trish Stone, and all of the other uh, staff members who worked so hard to uh, make this exhibition happen all through um, because there's so many the elements within it. It was a, a lot of work. Um, one of the uh, greatest pleasures in organizing an exhibition is always the rich learning process that you go through, you know, investigating work, talking to artists. Um, but this was especially true of Senses of Care uh, in that it represents uh, what can happen when a seminar turns into more than a seminar. Uh, I had been uh, working on a, uh, a, a, conducting a graduate seminar called Cultures of Care uh, with a group of uh, interdisciplinary uh, PhDs and a couple of uh, um, master's students from across communication, sociology, visual arts, literature, uh, international studies. I'm sure I'm missing some. Uh, and at the end of it, uh, uh, quite a number of them decided they wanted to continue reading and working together. And out of that, we decided to create this exhibition. So that's just a, a wonderful sort of experience. And the people involved, I should mention their names. It's uh, Jarna Menta, uh, Christina Ashana, uh, Amanda Kachia, Ivana uh, Guasari, Louise Hickman, Jennifer uh, Marchisoto, uh, Jamie Rao, Amanda Martin Sardino, Sandino, and Heidi, uh, uh, Heidi Smith. So in addition to uh, the exhibition, uh, we'll be having uh, two of the artists coming early uh, in late April to do a talk about the Salamander Project that's documented in the, in the gallery. But they'll also be doing a, uh, a live aquatics workshop at the, uh, the pool, the Canyon View pool. Uh, and that's for uh, people with uh, all sorts of abilities and they do photography and, and uh, video, but you don't have to go in the water if you don't want. You can also uh, be a land participant and there's a sort of free writing component that's uh, coupled with that. Um, uh, later on, we're gonna be having a round table with uh, two of the participants in the exhibition, um, uh, Sarah Hendren from the Ac Accessible Icon Project uh, and uh, uh, Sandy Yee, who does Crip Couture, along with a uh, uh, scholar, Rosemary Garland Thomas, who's author of the book, Staring. Um, and uh, that should be a wonderful round table in May. And then there'll be uh, several associated screenings that we still have to uh, determine dates for. So, care conjures a, a range of activities and dispositions at the core of social life. Care is obligation, Care is maintenance, care is sensitivity, care is concern, it's an expression of love. Care can be a means of control, care is labor, care is expertise. And as feminist scholars Carolyn, uh, Carol Gilligan and Eva uh, Federkate suggest, care forms a fundamental basis of our ethical frameworks. These professional, emotional, and ethical dimensions convey senses of care that interconnect, resonate, and cause frictions. They embody contradiction and provoke, uh, provoke tensions. While the term care evokes warm and positive connotations, the lived negotiation of care produces conflict, misunderstanding, and antipathy. Spaces, processes, uh, spaces and processes of care uh, can expose the most vulnerable core of personhood and challenge the bonds and the boundaries of identity. In his internationally renowned performance, Storm Reading, poet and performance artist Neil Marcus states, people are watching me. They are watching all the time when they're pretending they're not watching me to see how well I do the thing called human. Apprehension of humanness or personhood is conditioned by multiple metrics of belonging, framed by legal, economic, and effective concerns, and silently and explicitly judged and measured in terms of capacity, competency, 
and the performance of the illusion of autonomy. In relation to these measures of health and ability, care signals degree of humanness in ambivalent ways. Care resolutely confirms human connection and concern, and paradoxically, by announcing forms of heightened need, care can place the status of personhood in crisis. Care then appears as a threat or challenge. Unmarked care. Picture a dynamic map of caregiving, where it takes place, how it travels, the bodies and minds that it inhabits and moves between. Caregiving is commonly associated with services done for the very young, the aging, the ill, or the incapacitated. But arguably, most care is not given to those diagnosed as unhealthy or labeled as disabled. We all receive multiple forms of care that is unacknowledged, taken for granted, and unmarked. This invisible care forms the organization and infrastructure that supports everyday life. Our governing cultural lens visualizes caregiving as a response to exceptional needs or conditions, conditions that interrupt life as usual. As artist Park MacArthur notes, care means work, it means scheduling, it means people not doing other things in order to care. She notes that she usually gives the term, uses the term help to describe the assistance she requires, but that comes with its own baggage. The common connotations of care giving are unidirectional or lopsided. This one-sided image of care results from spatial and temporal tricks, conceptual maneuvers, standards that, that announce lack and misfit between dominant or acceptable needs and the diversity of lived experience. We live with environments, within environments built or structured around normative forms of maintenance and productivity. A fundamentally reciprocal understanding of care underlies the thinking of senses of care how we approach the exhibit and the work of the artists included. The work presented here suggests ways of undoing or sidestepping normative conceptual frameworks of care as a gift economy. They foster modes of thinking beside accommodation. Demands for access and independent living, living uh, that united the disability rights movement in the second half of the 20th century are encoded in the provisions of the landmark Americans with Disabilities Act of 1990. Two decades after its ratification, the social and institutional barriers that produce disability are still an important focus of activism and disability scholarship. Implementing the ADA mandate for accommodation of diversity, uh, of diversity of ability will no doubt be an ongoing effort for some time or in unforeseeable future. But an inevitable problematic of legislating forms of social care under the rubric of accommodation is that it highlights the work done by able-bodied people and institutions for those who are positioned as, as disabled. The labor of people with disabilities living and working within disabling structures remains invisible or unmarked itself. Perhaps more significantly, accommodation frames the infrastructures supporting contributions and participation as gifts to people with, to, with disabilities rather than the way in which we receive what they offer. At issue is, is whose needs are being addressed, who is being accommodated, and who is actually gaining access. The works in this exhibit project a redistrib redistributed sense of care. We choose to emphasize care as a term rather than caregiving because the forms of care enacted in these works belie the unidirectional connotation of giving and the passivity of those figured as in need of care. Beside foregrounding of the social rather than the medical orientations towards care, they value the traffic between lay and expertise, uh, expert knowledge, uh, a lay, I'm sorry, lay and expertise practices and knowledge of care. They lead us to think about how expert knowledge can be reappropriated as common knowledge and how common experience gets gathered up and guarded and sold as care. The ethics of care as a scholarly focus emerged in education studies and in relationship to developmental psychology. Care is knowledge and pedagogy, uh, and pedagogy has been an important site of the negotiation of how we care and how care is enacted and, uh, and valued. Um, this is an image from Park MacArthur and the Care Collective. From uh, It's a still from the video, It's Sort of Like a Big Hug, that's in the exhibition. 
In her art and writing, Park MacArthur reflects on the approach to she and her sister have taken to their personal need for uh, assistance. Living with a form of muscular dystrophy that progressively limits her mobility, she has organized a group of 10 people uh, that she calls the Care Collective to aid in her, her nightly routines that involve lifting and moving her from her bed into the shower and back into her bed. Um, the video is part of her exploration and reflection, reflection on the negotiation of intimate and convivial, uh, convivial relationships that accompany routines of care. And at the same time, she considers how uh, they can recast experiences of proximity and touch in ways that neutralize emotional closenesses. She writes, the assistive equipment and accessible civic infrastructure that allow Alex and me to ride public transportation and shop at the grocery stores do not, and never will, replace our reliance on people, day in and day out. And then she asks, how can workable, personalized systems take, uh, take shape amid current uh, extremes familiar to us? Why are state-right institutions presented as the answer for families who cannot afford the extraordinary costs of hiring help or working fewer jobs when caring for dependent adults. This is a label that she created as an artwork for the exhibition, which um, uh, lists uh, on an ongoing basis, uh, names are added to the bottom, this is off the bottom of the sheet here, people who are involved in actually carrying and holding her. Um, while Park MacArthur focuses our attention on intimate possibilities of informal collective and alternative modes of care, the photographs of Kathy Greenblatt transport us into professional settings that attend to more effective approaches of care, to care. Greenblatt retired from her career as a sociologist, sociology professor at Rutgers University to take up photography as a way of engaging more directly, more publicly, with the cultural concer concerns she was addressing. She travels internationally to find and document creative mo models of care for people living with dementia and Alzheimer's disease. Her photographs capture modes of care that allow people with Alzheimer's to sustain connections to others and to their own past lives at a far higher level than is generally believed possible. The work documents the social rather than the medical models of care that have been adopted in, mem in memory care facilities in Canada, India, France, the Dominican Republic, Japan, Monaco, and the US amongst others. She continues to travel uh, after more of a decade of this work. These works convey narratives about engagement in the moment that can help overcome the powerful cultural stigmas and fears surrounding memory loss. Greenbat's photography and her intimate involvement with the people and facilities she documents has become a significant conduit for the sharing both professional, uh, for sharing both professional and familial approaches to memory care. Christina Stevens, bridges the poles of patients' insights and clinical expertise in another, an altogether other way. A few years after completing her degree in occupational therapy, her lower leg was crushed when a car was work, she was working on fell on it. Taking on the moniker of amputee OT, she embarked on the documentation of her experience of amputation and the adjustment to the use of her new prosthesis. She produces a weekly YouTube series that employs a blend of frank discussion and clowning around to address practical and technical concerns, as well as social experiences of amputees. Her DYI uh, ethos is exemplified in the episode documenting her construction of a, uh, of a prosthesis from Legos, which is exhibited in the exhibition. You can see more of her videos out in the hallway. Um, our, episode, our other episodes consider creative adaptation of prosthes prostheses uh, and coordinated tattoos that provoke uh, an approach to amputee fashion uh, that is distinct from the well-known models like, uh, like a a Amy Mullins. Stevens' media practices foster a community of mutual care uh, that goes beyond the exchange of expert and lay knowledge to emphasize the importance of developing personal and long-term relationships uh, with your prosthetist. Um, these are images from uh, Sarah Hendren and uh, Brian Glenny's work, who are founder of the uh, Accessible Icon uh, Project. Louise will be talking about that uh, a little bit later. Uh, it's a guerrilla action project that's become uh, more of an institutionalized project for the, uh, the uh, a new icon uh, for accessibility. Um, the one thing that um, I wanted to mention about it uh, that she probably won't touch on is that 
whereas it's a very important intervention in ways that she uh, would discuss, it also echoes uh, a more popular uh, representation of disability, uh, and that is that of the, um, uh, the sports uh, wheelchair user uh, that's represented often as a, a sort of super crip model, and it comes with its own problems. And, and so one of the important things that you know, she thinks through is that there is no you know, universal design solution, that there is no perfect fit. Um, and just like when we were working on this exhibition, um, there was a, uh, a need for us to think through access in a way that the gallery often doesn't. There are things we don't have control over. We entered the gallery and immediately said, oh, the sound in here is impossible. There's this ambient uh, sort of uh, systems of the building that interferes with hearing for people who are hearing impaired. Um, uh, at the same time, there's no way to hang a painting at the ideal height or a photograph uh, for both somebody in a wheelchair and somebody standing up. Uh, so uh, the ideas of universal design, although they are you know, ultimately uh, a goal, they present uh, important problematics. Another take on access reframed or re-engineered is presented by deaf visual and performance artist Christine Sun Kim. Her work takes up aspects of sound that extend beyond the auditory, that is the main, um, that is the main way in which the hearing culture apprehends sound. One dimension of her work is the creative ways that sound can create visual phenomena. Sound is the physical oscillation of matter through space. Sound moves things, sound moves us. Kim's aesthetic experiments with sound are also an exploration of the politics of sound itself. Etiquette provides a normative social framework for expressing care, establishing routines and guidelines for avoiding disturbance or offense to others. Deaf from birth, Kim reflects on her own experience of reading and learning sound etiquette by mirroring other people's actions and reactions. Much of Kim's current work uses participatory pedagogical strategies to reformulate etiquette for handling sound. The video in interview presented in the exhibition accompanies one of her works in which she engages participant experiences of sound conveyed through piano wires and reverberating surfaces. Kim's work enacts a unique performance of care pedagogy rooted in, in differential aesthetic experience. Sandy Yi um, uh, is a uh, visual artist and um, uh, fashion designer. Um, caring for emo the emotional and psychological aspects of living experience is political. Sandy Yee takes up beauty and adornment as a site of intervention in how personhood is inscribed. Her work is about recognizing the individual and collective experiences of expressed in the pursuit of fashion for non-normative bodies, what she calls crip couture. She works closely with individuals to develop sculptural clothing and accessories that address and express their experiences and help to revisualize their individual forms of embodiment. The exploration of varied methods of crafting and processes, uh, uh, varied materials and crafting processes is an important part of the communication that constitutes her work. Finally, I just want to mention the work of Sins Invalid. Um, a powerful form of uncare or disinterest is enacted through the lack of visibility or discussion of sexuality and disability in mainstream media. Sins Invalid has been confronting this form of erasure through live performance and workshops through, since 2006. A disability justice-based performance project of artists with disabilities, centralizing artists of color and queer and gender variant artists, their performances explore themes of sexuality, beauty, and the disabled body. Their work elaborates new forms of sexy, aiming at inclusion of all individuals and communities. I'd like to uh, pass the, the mic over to Christina to uh, talk about uh, further about Neil and uh, Petra's work. Hello. Um, in the interest of uh, care, in, in the ethos of care and access, I'm going to disclose that I tend to speak too quickly, 
So if this happens, uh, please feel free to throw some multimodal signals out at me and I will attempt to rein that in. I would like to begin selfishly from a personal and theoretical premise that performance art, embodied experience conceptualized in a now, and care do not belong in separate realms such that one dwells in the world of contemporary art and the other in the world of medicine and therapy. Rather, care and performance are contingent on each other and produce one another in ways that are effective, generative, and non-essentialist. But allow me to pull back for just a moment to briefly engage with the idea of care as a broad aesthetic and conceptual category. Care is an all too familiar cultural trope invoked in banal, unqualified phrases, I care about you. And in grand narratives about caring states, caring leaders, and caring institutions. Beyond medical protocols, state-sanctioned health initiatives, or even emotional attachment, I want to imagine the possibilities of care that emerge through collectivity. In the case of contemporary art, it seems care is a significant topic for representation or to think through vis-a-vis -vis artistic practice. However, in the frame of performance, care is a topic that necessitates further imagining, and this is what I hope to touch on in the scope of my talk. How can, how can a performance-based project of care configure disability, a range of embodiments, experiences with chronic illness or fatigue, for example, within a material world of other bodies, materialities mixing and pushing on each other, how can somatic experiences of chronic pain and illness reconfigure historical emphases on medical or curative knowledge? Articulating care and performance, as I will explain through the work of the artistic collaboratory, the Olympias, confronts compulsions toward needing to know a body that needs care. How it feels pain, what medical interventions will cure and quote, care for one who is chronically ill, and measuring somatic responses against what is medically and culturally, quote, normal. Alternatively, performance as care, care as performance, and care through performance destabilizes a linear narrative of curative knowledge. There is not one direction that care operates in and through. Through performance, care is an enactment, and one that I believe deepens an understanding of interdependency as a practice. It is something that is engaged between multiple people and moves in multiple directions. It upends the idea that care is given from a position of professional knowledge or power to a disempowered other. The intersection of care and performance is the primary locus of activity for the Salamander Project. Hosted by the, the artistic collaboratory, the Olympias, uh, which is chiefly facilitated by the artists and writers such as Petra Cuppers, Neil Marcus, and many others, the Salamander Project is a collective-based performance series that has traveled across the United States in the past year. Cuppers and Marcus host workshops in public swimming pools, lakes, and other accessible bodies of water, inviting people with disabilities and their allies to participate in swimming and writing together. On the Salamander website, Cuppers' words explain the scope of this project. She writes, quote, since May 2013, disabled people and their allies have climbed into pools and oceans with us, and we float together, enjoying complicated freedom, companionship, and adventure. And we give ourselves to the pressures that the water exerts on us." End quote. This coming together of various bodies is experimental and positions the attention to different bodies in water, a form of intimacy and exploration, as a form of care that emerges in a collaborative event. Care is experimental and difficult. Pools themselves are not always accessible to everyone, and this is importantly reflected in the work of the Olympias Collective. In response to this problematic of access, the Salamander Workshop invites participants to engage in a variety of ways through both wet and dry workshops. The writing component, referred to as a dry workshop, curates an alternative mode of engagement with the project. Just as people can engage in caring in different ways suited to their needs and desires, these dry workshops reflexively construct spaces uh, where, so where somatic experience of being with is generated through collective writing. Some of these poems, reflections, and experimental writings are made available on the Salamander website after workshops, 
marking a textual and temporal trace that is an ever-expanding, living archive. In a recent text by Guillermo Gomez Pena, the performance artist reflects on his anxieties of archival practices in the face of live performance art's temporally fleeting ephemeral form. He meditates on a question that I believe is, a poignant, is poignant for both a dialogue on care and performance. Flying in the face of these fears and anxieties, he writes, quote, how can the evidence and memory of such an ephemeral art form be kept for others to learn and research, end quote. I argue that the Salamander workshops, in tandem with the archival texts and photographs on the Olympias website, shape the enactment of care as a pedagogical device. Being together in experimental and affective difficulty is not only a space of shifting desire, it can generate alternative forms of knowledge about bodies and how they move, how they press on each other and emerge through collectivity. As I near the end of my talk, I think it's crucial to remark upon the issue of access. Care is often necessarily collaborative, and in this collaboration, access, both to the space of a public pool itself or to the feeling of floating with another, is mediated through interdependency in water. I will also reflexively practice one form of access here through visual description. Both video, visual and audio descriptions are important components of the senses of care exhibition, mediating the possibility of access for multiple bodies. This is a photograph of Petra Cuppers and Sonny Taylor. These two figures, their backs illuminated and floating at the top of the frame of this image, are oriented in front of a marbled stone wall inside of a swimming pool. Cuppers, oriented to the left of Sunny, wears a floral bathing suit, strong arms splayed before her, cutting a path through the water. Sunny's live body swims underneath Petra's left arm. The arch in Sunny's back seems to cradle Petra's body. Concave and convex forms intimately touch one another. Their two profiles side by side, short crops of thick hair yielding to the material properties of water, reveal parallel affective experiences of swimming together. Sunny releases the tension of holding her breath, sending a cascade of bubbles across her squinched face and toward the surface. In her downward dive, Petra's face holds a different kind of muscular tension. Her calm expression belies the control of holding her breath, her lungs caught in a temporal zone of stagnant air, precarity and comfort entangled. These are only theoretical connections, of course. Speculations. There they are. Uh, speculations, curiosity, an engagement with work that is rigorously explored in critical disability studies and shaped through the curatorial language of contemporary art. To see, describe, and to imagine Mark, uh, Neil Marcus's limbs, lithe and strong, swirling in this effervescent matrix is one thing. But to participate, to become physically lifted and cradled, in the activity of swimming with others is quite another. On May 1st, a mere three weeks from now, I will slip into that state of playful unknown to become something other, to become vulnerable and open, to engage in complicated togetherness. To become salamander is not only to engage in the states of uncertain being, but to reshape zones of care beyond the supposed certainty of medical knowledge, beyond cure and to caring as a practice, from the grounded certainty of soil and, indeed, of this stage, into water. And you're all invited for May 1st to come and join us at the uh, Canyon View pool at 11 a.m. Uh, there'll be announcements sent out, so if you've got an announcement for your email, you'll get it about that as well. Luis? Me? Thank you, Christina. Okay. So today, Brian invited me. I you know that he's really difficult. <laughs> I'm going to push this down a bit. Okay. Can everyone hear me? Yes? Oh, good. Okay. So today, Brian invited me here to talk about the Accessible Icon Project alongside the Quick Time Technology piece which now I affectionately refer to as the Totem Project. I'm going to approach each of these projects through a framework of disclosure, or how collectively we can reclaim disclosure through practice of care. 
Disclosure is a tricky matter. Within the disability studies community, self-disclosure is not required. To, to clarify, the mark appearance of visible disability doesn't necessarily need to heed the demand of the diagnostic narrative, and that is closely followed by the right, right to privacy. The passage of disclosure and the risk involved cannot be understated. Alison Kafer gestured toward this at a recent talk right here on campus entitled Unsafe Disclosure, Tragedy, Trauma and Other Taboos. In this talk, I really liked how Kafer discussed how localised sites ranging from SDS to Society of Disability Studies meetings to informal gatherings can induce moments of disclosure with high stake, especially if these, ex if these gatherings are mediated around mixed company. There are those who represent the familiarity of the implicit subtle code that comes built into disability culture, and those who peddle the well-worn trope of diagnostic narratives. This means that disclosure is negotiated every day. Each one of us comes to mediate the notion of disclosure through multiple lenses. Today, I will follow Kay for example, and I will take a risk and I disclose my own crip identity. I am a self-identified crip, and I'm hard of hearing, and I'm a graduate student who requires both visual and textual support in seminar spaces. So when I say that, I kind of really wanted to acknowledge that even though I seek my, I disclose myself, I'm, I'm acknowledging that this is not um, for everybody. This is not a case for everyone that wants to disclose that. It is actually kind of a, comes with privileges. So shifting the parameters of disclosure within mixed company, in particular, when a space doesn't always belong to a culture of disability. It's a risky one. My disclosure is not about disability, but an opportunity to view how disability operates out in the world. For, in, for myself, the Totem Project comes about for two reasons. Collectively, the Totem came to be tactile and mobile devices that move through the seminar space to both reorientate time and experience band access across multiple bodies. So um, one reason that I brought it up, um, me and Brian had a conversation um, probably a month ago, um, and Brian said to me, why do you use the totems? And I said to him, OK, because I needed to solve a problem. And so that kind of idea of needing to solve a problem became like a really kind of important point of why I decided to talk today, because it's like this problem is trying to, how do you shape access within the classroom in, in the kind of already established infrastructure? So redrawing these lines of inclusion that reflect the collective process that access wasn't imposed by the seminar leader or the person with a disability. This means that access is collectively sought through multiple members. Care becomes a distributed process, constantly reshaping how access is negotiated. In the gallery space, the totem, as, as well as acting as devices of inclusion, each, of, each have shaped the interaction between seminar members. Um, or in t um, alerting how bodies are moved across the, across the room. For example, the Totoro, a plush toy which can be moulded to people touch, which is actually belong to Christina here, to the balls which reflect the standardised idea of how a totem comes to be in our hands. And other totems which have been informed by their technology 
have multiple functions, such as a flashlight can be turned on, a pair of sunglasses can be worn by the person who speaks. The totems are chosen and each member of, assumes an important role by bringing personal objects to the classroom. In this way, this contributes towards, again, distributed care. The opportunity to contribute an object also relocates the social responsibility away from the person who required ADA accommodation in the classroom or on the street, as shown by the Accessible Icon Project. By redirecting routes of access, we can collectively imagine alternative forms of care. The, pod the Totem Project it illustrates how we can distribute cares in various ways through a collective practice of participation, the interaction between the objects and the speakers, and the voluntary, that's the key word, voluntary contribution of others. In similar ways, the Accessible Icon Project. Um, can I have that device? Oh, it's already up there. OK. Which is primarily led by Sarah Hendren and Brian Glenny. This, again, operates on this kind of collective network. The project, by working through a network of people, had the ability to alter the dominant representation of disability questioning and reshaping through multiple bodies. The primary goal of the Accessible Icon Project is to reclaim the international symbol of access and transform the sign into an active, engaged image. The, so this image is taken from the website. OK. And so, so yeah, I'm going to move on to the next one. Oh, yeah. So people with disabilities have long have had a long history of being spoken for or being rendered into passive decisions about their lives. So this image here um, is actually the image that is new to kind of project and um, to be overlaid on the kind of the old symbol. So the new icon is depicted in an active propelling motion, again, I quote, the Accessible Icon Project. Quote, our active accessibility symbol helped us to reimagine how society and individual view people with disability. End quote. Okay. So the, so the next few slides are kind of like summing up the kind of process of all this. So the... the the new symbol is structured in a way that emphasises mobility and autonomy. The no, let's go back. So area one and two is gestured toward how the head is engaged in a forward motion of a person who is moving through the space. Here, the person is the driver or the decision maker about their mobility. The arm is pointing backwards to suggest a dynamic mo mobility of a chair and user. Depicting the body in motion represents the symbolically active status of negotiating the world. Now I go back. So here we are, back here. The images show how the Accessible Icon project can be created through across multiple bodies. The one image that's shown that material the news in the I actually can't see this, so I'm going to um, read ahead and then um, you'll have to provide your own visual access. Okay. Um, where am I? Okay. The one image shows that the material the news and the other is to pick the pa person actively engaged with the icon moving away from the standardization of the OJA symbol, reflecting the grassroots involvement of this collaborative effort. I hope over the course of this project, I'm going to show you a few more. OK. And this is the final image where 
the stencil is overlaid onto the floor with the spray can, I suppose. Thanks. <laughs> Both of these projects in mind, I have begun to implement design practice that allows for coordination of access access, creating a temporal kinship that can be reimagined and reclaimed what access means, one being that the ability to distribute social responsibility away through multiple sites and invention. So I'm I suppose when I talk about disclosure today, I really wanted to point to the relationship that's actually a quite a complicated relationship between disclosure and care and infrastructure. So how are all these come together to be mediated? And I actually think that it's worth underlining that sometimes that care is actually complicated and it mucky and it can be dirty so I think when I I I think what's really emphasized in this exhibition and um, for me is just to show the relationship between the two like the kind of triangulization between all these is to show that that this closure is a risky um, strategy to uptake sometimes but sometimes when the infrastructures are breaking down. And I think that is when disclosure is required. So sometimes the totem, for example, are kind of a mediator of an infrastructure that's broken down. So access is not always gained through perhaps the, the stenograph that's in front of me, the um, caption that in front of me right now. So. I think I will close out this talk, but before I do so, I again I'm going to be disclosing, but to do this talk today, I um, relied on the assistance of Jennifer here on my right and Christina on my left, and as well as other people in the audience. So I think it'd just be nice to acknowledge that. Thank you. Thank you, Luis and Christina. Um, we have a few minutes for uh, Q&A if people have questions they'd like to ask. So, um, I think it's a little different depending on the location, uh, but basically they um, try to scope out the space, see if it's accessible, if there's a roll and ramp into the pool or if there's a chairlift. And in, indeed, when we do the salamander workshop here, there are two chairlifts that are going to be available at the aquatic center. Um, uh, so that will be useful. Um, I think that they're sort of, um, it's, it's very much a, a sort of dialogical practice of coming together and, you know, figuring out who wants to swim, who has the, the ability to swim, who wants to work, you know, uh, participate in the dry workshop. And I think that care is less about certain modes of touching or knowing, you know, how not to touch or how to swim or how to move um, and more uh, built into the structure of the project itself, sort of giving people uh, an out if they don't want to participate in certain ways. Uh, a, a space to disengage even can be a mode of care to create those spaces. Yeah, I, I add to that, I think part of the project is also negotiating what it takes to support certain people in the water and to move them through and things like that. Yeah. Was um, I got the impression that as an economy that you want to transform our culture into a different a different way to what is the best way to switch? Well, I think part of it is a matter of of acknowledging that uh, that that care is something that's much more reciprocal. 
uh, and that people are receiving care that isn't called caregiving. That's part of it too. Yeah, exactly. So the accessible, uh, you know, ramp, for example, to think of that as a gift to somebody who needs the the, the care of access, you know, belies the notion that actually whoever's providing that, or you know, if if we have an interpreter here, is, is that uh, giving uh, access to Louise, or is it giving us access to Louise? I mean. Those are very different ways of configuring and understanding care. And so that, that's part of like questioning this idea of care as a gift. And we don't always call care caregiving or caretaking. Um, it's a very interesting dynamic. Yeah. So that, that's what I had in mind. Of course, that does involve, as you acknowledge, that transformative approaches, practices. It involves different ideas of status. I mean, when we think about the care with a capital C that you know, a, a physician gives, uh, as having a different status, a different economic um, uh, compensation than other forms of care, the care that someone who uh, is a migrant uh, worker uh, cleaning our institutions and uh, taking care of us in so many ways. Uh, that's a reorientation of care and what caregiving is. Yeah. Yeah. Many places are adopting it, and it's gotten sort of ADA approval as, uh, you know, because there are certain types of access forms that are given uh, that right. And I mean, they have on their website sort of a historical evolution. The original sign didn't even have a, a circle for a head, uh, as opposed to the other ones that did. But yeah, I think that they lose something. I think that, well, you know, uh, and others can comment on this, that I think there is an acknowledgement that they're not perfecting, and this isn't the answer, it isn't a design answer, that it is the contrast and that switch that make people aware, and if this was the dominant one, there are differences. You have to say that this does connote for us motion and activity in other ways, but uh, you know, as I was saying earlier, uh, what this does also is um, you know, cop to the sort of normative assumption that the more mobile someone is, the more valuable they are. So that you know, someone who is not a wheelchair athlete or just somebody who uh, has uh, that level of control that this connotes. I mean, this control is somebody who can, can move. Um, uh, I mean, it's debatable. In some ways, this could project onto people who have less mobility, a sense of mobility, symbolically. But it can work both ways. Do, Luis, do you want to respond to that at all? No, OK. Um, sorry, I didn't get the actual question. Oh, okay. Is it? Um, I, I think um, uh, Fernanda was ask, uh, suggesting that uh, with the adoption of this logo mm -hmm. as an official adoption by, say, a city like New York or uh, UCSD, as we will be petitioning as part of this gallery exhibition mm -hmm. to adopt that as the new sign, as it gets adopted, will uh, does that sort of move it out of this sort of active, uh, productive. Right, so you're saying when it's superimposed on the old one, you see the difference, or if it's superimposed in our memory of, of the recent replacement. Yeah, um, I, I understand what's going on. Um, you know, I think it's actually quite interesting, the, the idea of overlaying it, because I think it actually shows like kind of active participation as well, the kind of, almost like the traces of what came before as well. I think it's actually quite interesting and, and I think it's an, an interesting project that I really hope that we do do here and that uh, I think it, it kind of 
goes back to the talk that I did yesterday. It's uh, yeah, not all of you were there, but I'm, I was uh, illustrating how that through activism and the academy, how we have to constantly renew the link between these two discourses to understand that we always have to go back to the body and how the body is located in the kind of larger structure. So I think it's kind of a nice conversation between the two. Yeah, just to fill in a little bit on Louise, what Louise talked about yesterday, she presented a short film of herself uh, trying to use one of the campus buses. Uh, and the film involved quite a lot of waiting and uh, either the lack of uh, functioning of the uh, wheelchair lift or lack of knowledge of the uh, student driver of how to uh, lift it. And then eventually a sort of negotiation of saying, oh, are you OK with waiting for the next bus? Um, but just to show, and there was posted on the side of the bus something about sustainability and a sort of progressive logo about the canvas. Um, so just this constant negotiation of, of crip time, that was a big part of her talk. I, th I think it's um, interesting that um, the idea of failure, how that can figure into the talk of waiting for the bus that never arrives. And you know, like for the, um, I didn't get the question or I didn't, I couldn't navigate the access in this, in this moment. And I think that these moments of failure or discomfort is actually, again, raises these like, really important question of how we think about how we function through care and how we mediate interaction or independency through others. Kristen? Well, it's such a central theme to disability studies, the, the question of that, you know, what connotes personhood is a question of, you know, what is uh, within the realm of the type of care that we find acceptable, reasonable, et cetera. Um, but, you know, I think it's, uh, it parallels a lot of discussions within critical race theory and elsewhere of whether you're trying to make difference disappear uh, or other ways of embracing difference, acknowledging, uh, et cetera. So I mean, I, 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 I don't think it's a question that's solved by universal design, even if universal design sometimes, and this goes to the issue of disclosure, I think that Luis is talking about. There are times when one doesn't need to mark differences of ability, even if one accepts them, they're visible or not, and there may be ambiguity, uh, any more than any other difference. But to assume you'd come up with a mode of care that creates erasure, I, I don't know if that would be the answer. Uh, I think actually there, that this concern was reflected in a talk that uh, Louise pointed out in her, in her talk uh, when Alison Kafer came to visit. Um, the, Louise, remember the title, Un Unsafe Disclosures? Alison Kafer's talk? It's mm -hmm. like unslash. Slash safe disclosures. Yeah. Yeah. So in her talk, she was, um, she was engaging with the idea of trigger warnings. And she mentioned that when she, uh, when she was teaching this class, uh, she would, you know, they would eventually come to the discussion about uh, rape or sexual violence. And there was a sort of idea about, okay, like we're gonna talk about rape now, so if you need to leave the room, it's okay, trigger warning. But in what ways, um, by, by marking that sort of topic as, as something that requires a trigger warning, does it erase other issues that, that can bring up strong effective responses in that course, such as talking about class, talking about poverty, talking about you know, race, for example. And so her sort of strategy was to think about how do we create a space that, um, I, I, I guess it sort of speaks to universal design in some way, but how do we create a space that isn't about marking the moment that, that one can, can leave or choose to, to move away or when it's okay, no one's gonna question whether or not you leave the room, um, but how do we make a space that enables people at any time to um, kind of draw back 
to, to not engage, to so, so the sense that safety could be embedded in the structure of that class, a space to draw away and not participate. And so I'm, I'm not sure if that's really answering the question, but I feel like in some way it's reflective of this concern about, you know, how do we care for all kinds of people, but then if you care for everyone, does that kind of erase or make invisible people who need more care? Um, yeah. I think that's um, actually been a big part of the conversation that we've had in our, our seminars. And I also think picking back on what Christine is talking about, that would be part of the classroom too. It's not just having a place to fall back to, but understanding how you know a culture of a very um, heterogeneous classroom can also be a culture where there are certain norms of safety and of support. You know that that you build an awareness that safety is within that room culturally, uh, in terms of various modes of acceptance. It's hard to come up with a normative standard of that, but uh, paying attention to it, I guess, is what she was talking about pedagogically. Right. Yeah, so that those types of, you know, infrastructural um, changes signal certain social uh Yeah. Well it's really they've established a non profit and it's really uh, spread in a very big way, this project. Edward. Good question. Um, I have thoughts on it, but why don't I turn that over to the two of you first? How do you, how do you feel the experience of creating this exhibition might contribute to a sense of transformation, or not a sense of, but modes of transformation? Can you say that again? How would you, how do you feel participating in you know, the organization of an exhibition like this might fit within ideas of you know, transforming, uh, you know, a sort of broader social transformation of structures of care, cultures of care? Um, I guess part of the question is the strategy of an exhibition, what does it do? I'm, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna join the, co the question on to Christo. Um, what I wanted to say earlier is um, I actually think that care can be reimagined in quite exciting ways too. Um, so I think that the Totem Project started out as this device that was going to seem to be constricted, so people were concerned that it would limit people's how they would speak in the classroom, for example. And so what actually happened was that it's 
the totem started in a, a femtech class, which would encourages this kind of feminist collaboration. And so people brought these objects, which are displayed in the um, gallery. And so what actually happened was that people's relationship to others changed because of the totems. So then it became more ex and an exciting possibility, you know, that one week that we had a, um, a pen knife, which is Monica, I don't know if she's still here, but we had a pen knife and we had to pass this pen knife around, but we couldn't throw it across the classroom. We c you know, so in, in fact, people had to get up out of their chairs and they had to move to the other side of the room or, you know, or it would involve passing it around the table. Um, but going back to what you were saying, Christo, is actually what happens is the care becomes reimagined in these ways that is how we engage with the objects, so how we hold the objects. And so these are transferred across to how we think about access in the classroom. It's almost like served as a kind of um, a reminder of the access that is going on in the classroom as, as well as other things. So actually care is taken from this kind of the larger kind of issue and then focusing it down to the object to be passed. So I think actually in ways like that, disability and disability access can actually be really exciting and create the kind of alternative ways of becoming. Yeah, I think that uh, even in to sort of focus more on your question, um, this issue of transformation in, you know, in, in sort of conceptualizing this um, exhibition with uh, this, you know, the entire curatorial team and many of them are here, um, there was this idea about, you know, in what ways could we sort of alter the normative experience of being in a gallery? And Ivana actually brought up this really interesting idea about how, how could we sort of maybe change this, the sense uh, the sensory experience of being in the gallery apart from walking in and looking at things at about, you know, average height and then, you know, walking away. But I think that we managed to capture some of the aspects of a more transformative um, exhibition in the sense that outside of the exhibition, there's a reading room area. There's, there's a, um, maybe Heidi can talk more about it because she worked, Heidi and Jennifer can talk about it a little bit more. Um, but there's sort of a space outside of the gallery to sit and and you know, scan with your smartphones these sort of like codes, and that they would enable you to sort of get the text that um, actually generated this sort of uh, group, this curatorial group. Um, some of the readings that we had done in the Cultures of Care seminar, um, and I also think that the the totem uh, exit uh, uh, part of the project is really interesting in the sense that you can pick up the objects, you can hold them, you can engage with them materially in the same way that we do in, in the seminar space. So, like I have the Totoro, and, and I tend to like, you know, hold on to it, or like in, in some of our past seminars, I'll notice how Brian will like rotate the Totoro. And so like each of us kind of interact with it differently. And, and like Louise mentioned, with, with the pen knife or with the small zip uh, drive, you know, there's a sense that you can't like throw it across the room because someone can't catch it. So it's reorienting movement, um, both in the seminar space and also, this is also reflected, I think, in the exhibition, because you can actually pick up the totems. And Louise also mentioned uh, before we came in here that everyone should pick up the totems. Is that yes. right, Louise? And um, eat candy, do whatever. <laughs> um, yeah, I, my, my answer to that, I think, ha in some ways, reflects how I think about curatorial practice that I've been doing for some time. I was a curator at the New Museum in New York through the 90s. And um, collaborative work is a really important transformative practice. I think there's a, there's a sense that comes out of an exhibition like this where you work with a lot of people. Uh, that's a different sort of authorship. But I also think that you know, gallery-based pedagogy, uh, like other forms of intellectual work, it's hard to trace the effects you have. Uh, just even knowing who reads what you've written is often hard, but also what they remember and when they remember it. Uh, I think you're dealing with a different sort of sensorial ex experience in a gallery that affords you different potentials for uh, people to remember, to mimic, and, and things like that. But I also think that the work of curating an exhibition like this is not just about what takes place in the gallery. 
Uh, Kathy Greenblatt, whose photographs are in there, had sent me an email. This is how I actually found out about her work, because somebody suggested me as someone to talk to about assessment of her exhibition that was traveling uh, internationally. And she had called on a group of other uh, sociologists and others to help her create a legitimate means for assessing it, because that's how you get funding, et cetera. And they all came up with this idea of your typical survey form that's given to viewers asking the exact same questions before they go in the gallery and when they leave, like to say, what have you learned? And I just said that's patently ridiculous, because um, I don't think you, you can measure things in, in that sort of a way. Um, but I actually think the measures are really diverse and they have as much to do with Kathy's career as they do with you viewing the work in the show. In other words, Kathy's work going around and photographing all of these uh, memory clinics internationally uh, creates conduits of knowledge and sharing of what these institutions do that go well beyond the photographic practice, but by supporting her photographic practice, by fostering her as a creative person, that's another side to it that's really important, the type of response that the artists get, not just the people who come and view it. And that's something we don't often think about, about the process of what an exhibition does. Maybe one last question, because I know we're over time. Um, I don't know if this is a question for Louise or if you want to answer it, but in, in various contexts I've, I've, I've talked before about the fact that an icon, the head is separated from the rest of the body. I think that's true in the whole world, too. And I was just wondering if any of you have any thoughts about the rationale for that? What's that, what's that supposed well, to be? Well, the old one that they've shown and most of the ones that it isn't actually separated. So it is something I've thought about too. But um, you know, I've looked at a bunch of them. There are some others that I've seen that do have the, the head separated and it often has to do with dynamism. But do you have um, The only thing I was going to add to that is the actual first symbol didn't have a head. Didn't have a head at all, yeah. yeah. Right. Um, but it is a question. Um, I can see why if they attached it, it wouldn't work in the same way in, in this. But you know, if you've done that sort of design work, you, you know how these really sort of particular slight movements of an element can change so, things so dramatically. Um, I mean, the circle echoes with the circle in the bottom and various things that just wouldn't happen. So that's my aesthetic critique. You're saying it's about dynamism? I think so. I think that, that uh, that's what they were working for in this, in this symbol. I don't think it, it figures as decapitation. Uh, in, in my view, I know that, that's one of the concerns that you know, I could say you think about. Yeah. What? It's a great gift, an animated uh, yeah. gift. Yeah. Uh, Maybe one last, last question. Yeah. Well, I think that <clears throat> that'd be a really great question for Petra and Neil, who are going to come in three weeks, and they sort of make these decisions. I mean, that's a really interesting question, and, and I'm sure that um, that would be maybe like a future project to think about uh, creating a sort of accessible space rather than just find whatever space is available. But I think that that idea of finding the available space is very much how these, you know, this sort of these things happen, and it very much reflects the, you know, the experience of okay, can I get in this pool? Like, is it accessible? Um, but yeah, I think that you should come and do the project and ask them. Um, I think we should wrap up. We can talk more outside. I just want for one second before everybody else gets up, just the rest of the curatorial team to stand up so that people see them and uh, can identify them out in the discussion area. And <laughs> Thank you very much for coming. And enjoy the refreshments. Oh, yeah. Have, oh, one more announcement. A little announcement. Um, we have a nice little uh, reception outside. And lately, what we've been doing is we've been letting the presenters choose the artwork that they want to display. And we've been doing that again tonight. Uh, that way, we make sure that they get some. Okay. <laughs>
Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>